Father, we are so grateful, Lord, to be here in your house. Father, we are so grateful to have your Holy Spirit flowing through this place. Lord, we are, our hearts are open. Our eyes are open. Lord Father, we are ready to receive the word from Pastor Juanita this morning, Lord Father, that we will be able to take that word, Lord Father, and bury it deep in our hearts, Lord, that we will be able to apply it to our lives, Lord, that we will be able to grow more and more like you, as it says in the scriptures, to be going from glory to glory, to be able to see clearly. That is what we want, Lord. That's our heart's desire, Lord Father. So as we continue our worship in, in the word, Lord, I ask that you help us continue in this, this uh, atmosphere of worship and praise to you, Lord Father. All this we ask in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Dismiss the kids. Get the kids, the kids. If Miss Denise is going to take you down. And can I say it is I feel like it's family reunion day, don't you think? <laughs> it's so good to have everybody back. Uh, Jerry, we've missed you so much. Pray, praise God that, uh, that he's working in that hip and healing your body. Uh, Bruce, Bruce back there and Tam, uh, not Tamara, Sarah. We've been praying for Tamara. Yes. Um, the brain aneurysm, if you weren't here last week, their daughter had a brain aneurysm and ran into a telephone pole and has had two brain surgeries and now is home. Lost a lot of weight, but weak, but she's home. We're so, so, so thankful that um, God is working on, on your behalf. Uh, Adi, we welcome you back. We welcome home. <laughs> and um, there's so, and Carrie, I didn't get a chance to say thank you for, I did say thank you, but you weren't here last week because you were on, but thank you for covering for Father's Day. Uh, really appreciate that, and it was beautiful um, to have you and Dylan here. I watched it, so I really enjoyed it. And our guest from Georgia, thank you so much for, for uh, well, uh, coming today and um, being part of our, our family. And Sam, yes. Sam, yay, Sam. <laughs> we have been praying, praying for you and your health and for that trip upcoming, that God's favor amen. would be, yes, amen. So God, we serve a mighty, mighty God. Uh, well, there's been, who else have I forgotten? I just love to see all of you here. <laughs> love all of you. Uh, um, it's, we've, there's been uh, several references to our uh, VBS, and um, we had an awesome time, and I do feel a little rummy, and we'll get a little more into that. You wouldn't think we had, what, I think 17 kids at the most, uh, but we had, I think, that many leaders. There's uh, hundreds of pictures on, on Facebook, but I really, really want to say thank you to um, Michelle and to Mark and for leading that, uh, getting that all together. And every, 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 every leader there, Dell and Viana, you guys are fantastic. Those young, those young legs and, and <laughs> uh, Linda and Karen helping us, jumping in in the kitchen and, and having fun down there and providing and Lorraine jumping in everywhere. Peggy all over the place. Elena and Richard, the set, I can go on and on. Mike brought his muscles with the picnic tables. <laughs> Everybody just pitch in. Joe is not here today, but she was wonderful and a team leader. Sandy's also traveling with their family today. Um, so many wonderful, um, wonderful experiences. And reaching out, why do, we, why do we do those crazy things? To reach families, to reach families and to reach the kids. Um, because there are kids, lives are changed when they go home. And the parents know that we love those kids. And they know that this is a safe, safe place. So thank you for being the church that, that you are. Um, would like to encourage you before I get into the message about the 4th of July. That's our next outreach. And really, this is a perfect time to just bring your neighbors or your friends. I know that some of you have the other family things going, so we'll excuse you. We'll miss you, but you can go. But, we, but, but if you can join us, please do drop in or camp out with us. The schedule, 1 o'clock is check-in time. 3 o'clock, we'll do water baptism. Uh, not too late to jump in and be baptized. If you would like to, just let me know. Uh, and then the potluck uh, will provide the hamburgers and the hot dogs. 
and then you guys bring everything else, okay? <laughs> bring everything else. And then the fireworks will start at 9 o'clock. So really a fun thing. And then the ladies' tea, again, that's our um, another we're looking forward to that. Lainey's hiding back there. She's uh, our women's ministry leader. She's providing or has ordered the food uh, for it. It's going to be fabulous. If you come, you're going to make out like a bandit. I'm just telling you. <laughs> We're going to have lots of door prizes. So bring your uh, friends and neighbors and grandmas and, and granddaughters and whoever. Bring them. Uh, I really The message is really um, life-giving, uh, how God has made us uh, beautiful and uh, it will be a really a great time. So please come and then, uh, on that. So, okay. So uh, here we go. <laughs> um, Heavenly Father, I just thank you. Lord, you are mighty. You are strong. You are good. You are faithful, Lord. Thank you for bringing our family back together, Lord. Thank you for helping Tamara and healing her body, Lord. And we know you are not finished there. We know you are not finished in bringing strength to Jerry and her leg and healing in the hip and making her mobile again. And for Sam and this trip, Lord, and his body, we give you praise. We thank you, God. You are a God that hears us. You are mighty and strong, and we give you all glory, all praise in your mighty name. Amen and amen. All right. So um, on Tuesday afternoon, I hooked up the hose outside in case Denise needed it for the um, outdoor games. And early in the afternoon, I heard water running, and uh, Peggy showed up to water the plants. And I walked over to say hello to Peggy. And may I tell you, <laughs> she had the hose and she blasted me right in the face with that, that hose. <laughs> and in a split second, I was soaked from head to toe. I had my only change of clothes on. And my reaction was less than holy, I will let you know. <laughs> uh, it was uh, one of um, not even shock and awe, but one of just pure shock, right? <laughs> right, my friend? <laughs> Definitely shocked and stunned. And I, um, I said, uh, do not ever do that again. <laughs> Those were my words. And she, she laughed, and I said, no, do not ever do that again. <laughs> and, and she said, she said, the Holy Spirit told her to do that. And I, and I said, I, I do not think so. <laughs> but um, sure enough, here we are. Uh, I believe perhaps he did so we could have this illustration for, for today. Um, God is good, and we are talking about the last section in um, the Sermon on the Mount. Um, and so she apologized, and we had a really great time. But um, God just uses whatever, right? And that we worked hard in that VBS, and I, I guess I did need to laugh, even though I can laugh now, but not at the moment. <laughs> I was not laughing. Uh, so uh, uh, Eric surprised me a few weeks ago when he, when he woke up and he said he had a um, prophetic dream. And I thought, what a strange thing that is. When did Eric start having prophetic dreams? And, uh, but he went on to say that he saw a deeply plowed field. And the soil was being prepared. And it was not an easy task. But the work was hard. And it was difficult. And it was being done right. And um, I feel that is God saying for us, this church, it's hard and it's difficult, but he's helping us. My mind went to Acts 2, 17 and 18. And the last day, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. And your old men will dream dreams. <laughs> Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they will prophesy. Amen. So this last week was hard. We talked about that. And the week before that was hard. <laughs> and the week before that was hard. Ministry can be tough. It's a delight and a joy. And this last week, Eric um, 
was gone, and I actually just was around my kitchen, and I was singing, the joy of the Lord is my strength, and I just sang, and I did circles. I did a little Jericho march because I needed a little joy of the Lord, and I needed a, a lot of strength, but um, I am certain that I'm not the only one that ministry was tough this last week. And those of you that weren't able to come to VBS, I know you were praying. We sent out the prayer flare and said, we need some Holy Spirit here, and reached out, and God helped us. And Bruce and, and Sarah, you planned, and your hearts was with us, and I know that you, you prayed also. He uses all of us. But during that time when we were in ministry, there were several times just like that blast in the face. Peggy said, welcome to VBS week. And I went, whoa. <laughs> but there were other times during the week, other people got a blast in the face. It wasn't with the water, but it was the unexpected phone call from the family crisis or something gone awry or things that, or bodies not working the way they should. <laughs> um, but... At our moment of exhaustion comes the attack many times, just like the enemy attacked um, our Lord and Savior. He hopes to confuse us, to overwhelm us, and even pl plant that seed of fear and doubt. In our worst case scenarios, uh, doubt ourselves and even our very foundation. So before we get in the text this morning, I wanted to share a little bit of, uh, from Elijah, Eli, about Elijah in 1 Kings 18 and 19. And you don't necessarily need to turn there, but hopefully you know the story. I'm just going to paraphrase it. But Elijah had uh, defeated the prophets of Baal. I hope you remember that. God sent fire down to destroy the sacrifice and the altar. And then Jezebel came and threatened him. And Elijah was afraid, it says. And he ran a day's journey into the desert. He was tired and exhausted, and he sat down under a broom tree. He prayed <laughs> that um, he might die. He said, Lord, I've had enough. <laughs> Take me. <laughs> I've had enough. He lay down, and then he fell asleep. The angel woke him, told him, get up and eat. He did, and then he ate some more, and he went to sleep. Then the angel woke him up a second time, get up. And eat, you're going to need your strength for your next journey, your 40 days and 40 nights to the mountain of God. And on he went, and then he reached the mountain of God, and then he took a nap in a cave. I like Elijah. I like to sleep. God woke him up there, and he said, why are you here, Elijah? And, uh, and Elijah said, I've been zealous for you, God. I've served you well, and now Jezebel's trying to kill me, and I'm the only one left. Elijah was having a bit of a moment. <laughs> Have you ever had a bit of a moment? <laughs> uh, God went on to show Elijah he was not alone. God was with him every step of the way. So as I explained, my week started with a blast to the face, my, and by Thursday afternoon, Eric's text that he was called out to a fire and that he would be leaving Friday morning. He would not be here for the 4th of July as we planned to help me. And I had a bit of a moment, <laughs> a bit of an Elijah moment. I'm exhausted and now I'm abandoned, or at least I felt like it. He's leaving me with no means. He's leaving me no trailer to stay in, no place for the granddaughters to come and camp out with, no one to help me to do everything that I need done. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> it was late by the time I got home Thursday, and he was still up, sitting there in the chair, and I sat down, and I was silent. I dared not speak. <laughs> I knew the poison would flow out of my mouth. He was wise enough after 35 years to let me go sleep <laughs> and not pursue it. I fell into bed and slept at 3 o'clock in the next morning. And I feel him on the, sat down on the bed, and he says, do you want to get up and talk? 
And I thought, nope, <laughs> I do not, <laughs> but I will get up. So I kept my silence, and I got up, and uh, at the end of the couch, he's one in, and I'm the other, and he said, hello, and I went, <laughs> still silent. <laughs> I was having a long moment, just letting you know, a long moment. After a cup of coffee, a few sentences of poison slipped out. But here's the thing. It wasn't until I was willing to surrender that my healing began. It wasn't until I walked over to Eric and just wrapped myself around him, and he thought it was a quick hug, but I was not letting go. <laughs> I just hugged him, I hugged him, and then the silence sobs started. And I was reminded of that's how God is. When we're broken, we're tired, and we're exhausted, and we push him back, we push him back, we push him back, but then when we come to him, and we just wrap our arms around him, or we fall on our face or our knees, he just holds us. And those sobs are release. We release all the disappointment, the fear, and the weariness. They're all washed away. And the solid rock remains. You see, I hadn't lost my faith. I hadn't left my husband. I was weary. I was zealous doing good things. I was disappointed. And it took a bit of a moment, a bit of sandblasting to get down to the foundation of that solid rock. Eric said a while back, he didn't know he's going to be in church today. He's getting picked on today big time. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think I may, he tells, he tells me, I think I may need to help you get the sand out of your ears. <laughs> what? <laughs> he says, because your head is buried pretty deep. <laughs> and so today I've titled Sandblasting Foundational Truth. Sandblasting Foundational Truth with a bit of a moment, okay? That's my tagline. Um, perhaps that blast of water in the face uh, was God trying to wash the sand out of my ears, right? <laughs> God is trying to teach Juanita to take a Sabbath, teach me many things as I go and travel five days a week, how not to get weary, how to be zealous, how to take care of myself. Proverbs 14.1 in the King James says, The wise woman built her house, but the foolish pulls it down with her own hands. We are either in the construction business or the demolition, demolition business. And there's a distinction between the wise and the foolish woman. Her hands symbolize her own actions or behavior. She destroys herself and her family. Don't be foolish and tear down your spiritual house with your own hands because we want our own way, because things don't go how we think they should go, because we block the Lord in our lives. And perhaps even in our households, Proverbs 14, 26, and 27 goes on to say, In the fear of the Lord, there is strong confidence, and his children will have a place of refuge. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to turn one away from the snares of death. So we have a choice here, the construction or the demolition of our households. We can be foolish and tear down our house with our own actions, our own poisonous words, our lack of integrity, or the Lord tells us we can have a strong confidence in him. The strong confidence, the strong, solid rock foundation representing the fountain of life so clear back in the beginning of february believe it or not we started the sermon on the mount the series but um the foundation of the sermon on the mount started long before february in my life if you remember i shared with you that as a fifth grade girl my sunday school teacher challenged us to memorize the three chapters uh, for a prize steak dinner. And the Sermon on the Mount is said to be the greatest sermon ever preached, containing some of the most famous scriptures and stories and parables. And I trust that you realize that now, and they've become familiar with you as we've studied. 
Jesus is indeed inviting us to a different way of life. He's joining us in kingdom. He's inviting us to join him in kingdom living, even now as we live in this fallen world. Chapter 5 started with a series of remarkable statements. Those are the Beatitudes, which are often misunderstood. And we quote them each week and celebrate recovery. Thank you, Elena, for sharing that testimony. Celebrate Recovery is indeed a wonderful ministry to all of us, and everyone is invited. But the eight principles of Celebrate Recovery are the, based on the Beatitudes. Are called the, They pave the road to recovery. And as we wrap up today is the last Sermon on the Mount. We'll hear once again the invitation Jesus gives us to the different way of life. And as the crowds gathered on the hillside beside the Sea of Galilee, Jesus spoke in his own name, on his own authority, in a way they had never heard anyone speak before. And in the final section here on the Sermon on the Mount, in just a few minutes, we're going to read from Matthew 7 and starting with verse 24. And we're going to look at the parable of the wise and the foolish builders. The parable serves both as a conclusion to the Sermon on the Mount and the illustration illustrates the absolute necessity of doing the will of God. That is, all the things Jesus has been teaching us these last three chapters. So let's read Matthew 7, starting verse 34. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine puts them, and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house, house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house. Yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. So Jesus gives a picture of two men building a house. One man thinks very little of what might happen in the future, and he's called the, the foolish man in verse 26. The other man, also building a house, seeks to sure the foundation is built upon the solid rock, and he's called the wise man in verse 24. And so we have a simple story going on here, the two men building houses. One is wise, one is foolish. And what seems like a very simple story is really a powerful commentary on people who have a head knowledge of God, but an empty heart. You notice that when he says, everyone who hears, these are the people who are to hear. They hear the message. They listen. They understand it. The wise one does something about it. The fools do not. Jesus is closing the sermon with an invitation, and we read that earlier uh, a few weeks ago in verses 13 and 14 the invitation to the narrow gate and the narrow path. He said it wouldn't be easy. Last week we heard about the false prophets encouraging us to join the crowd on the broad path. And our choice is difficult because self-deception comes so easy and naturally to us. Many say they know Christ, but they don't do what Christ asks. They say they don't do. They have head knowledge without Heart knowledge. So here Jesus reminds us that the standard of righteousness is required for entering the kingdom of God. Unless you put your life built on that standard, no matter what it looks like, no matter what you know in your head, no matter how feverishly you conduct your spiritual activity, you can work yourself to death for God and still not know him. When the floods come, you're going to get washed away if all you have is head knowledge. Empty words and an empty heart. And so the contrast in verses 24 through 27 is between two people who hear. Some hear and obey, some hear and disobey. Both individuals build a house. He simply doesn't apply, it, it doesn't imply that the house is any different for either of them. They both build the house. It's in the same place. They have the same storm, and they built it in the same way. It's true that believers and false believers can live side by side, live on the same block, 
We can attend the same church. We can go to the same Bible studies. Their difference in their buildings a lot of times is indistinguishable to most people because the foundation is not often seen. And only an honest searching of our souls reveals our true foundation. The Greek word for rock at the end of verse 25 is Petra, a rock bed. And I have a couple of pictures. In verse 26, the word sand is the Greek word of Amon. In the area of Jordan, there are two cities. One is named Amon, sorry, Amon, and the other is Petra. And the city of Petra, which still stands today, is entirely carved out of the rock. Said one person can guard the whole city because that's the only entrance right there into their city. And then there's the city of Amman, who's on the edge of the desert. And when you go to Amman, there's only one thing that you see, and that's sand. Sand, sand everywhere. Jesus tells us the wise man built on the rock bed, and the foolish built on the shifting sands. And last week we heard there's some land agents, right? False prophets. They're setting up real estate <laughs> offices to sell sand lots. Don't buy them. Don't buy from the false, <laughs> from those real estate agents. A man is a fool to buy on sand because when the storm comes, it will fall flat. And I was going to uh, get Elena to help me, but does anybody else remember the Sunday school song? The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. And the rains came tumbling down. And that says the rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. And the house on the rock stood Firm. Now the foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. Oh, oh that's, <laughs> she's got it better. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. And the rains came tumbling down. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods. Are you going to listen to this all week? The rains came down and the floods came up. My favorite part. Um, went smash. That's the part we all liked as kids. The smash part. <laughs> You're all going to sing that all week long. And it goes on. We won't sing it. So build your life on the Lord Jesus Christ. And the blessings will come down. The blessings come down as your prayers go up. So build your life on the Lord. I have another picture. The tallest lighthouse in the United States is at Cape Hatteras in North Carolina. It's 193 feet tall when it was built in 1869, and it was over half a mile from the seacoast. But over time, 30,000 feet of beach eroded. Why and how? Because of the rain, the wind, the storms eroded the shore. 130 years of time, it went from 30,000 feet to 160 feet. From the shore. So something had to be done. In 1999, the Army Corps of Engineers developed an elaborate rail, rail system, hosted up, hoisted up the lighthouse, all 4,800 tons, and moved it 2,900 feet inland where it stands today. Why this drastic task? Because of the wind and the rains and the storm had taken its toll. The lightning, the, the, they were threatening the foundation of the massive lighthouse because it was literally standing on sinking sand. I wonder what our lives are on, sinking sand or that solid rock. I think to myself when I read Jesus' words here, if you listen to my words but you don't put them in practice, you're like this lighthouse. The foundation will eventually crumble. But it says, if you hear my words and do what I say, then your life will be built on a firm foundation, the solid rock. What is the rock? It's obedience to the word of God. Yes, God is a rock. Yes, Christ is the chief cornerstone. 
James 1, says, do not merely listen to the word, so to deceive yourself, do what it says. And that's what Jesus is saying here on the Sermon on the Mount. If you hear and you don't do it, you are deceiving yourself. Verse 23 goes on and says, anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks in a mirror, at his face in a mirror, and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. In Luke 6, 47, and um, the scriptures may not be on the screen following, but there's a parallel message to the wise man, and it says, the wise man dug deep. He went to the rock of the word of God. He blew away the sand, the sandblaster, and he dug deep. He emptied himself of self-righteousness, self-sufficiency. He knows he's nothing. He's, not, oh, he's overwhelmed by his sin, and he surrenders to God. He went to the rock of obedience, the wise man, God's word. C.S. Lewis has a story he says, when I was a child, I often had a toothache. I knew if I went to my mom, she would give me some pain medicine, and that would deaden the pain, and I would be able to go back to sleep. But I would not go to my mom, at least until the pain got really, really bad. Why? What was the reason he wouldn't go? He didn't <laughs> doubt that she would give him the pain meds he needed. But I knew she would do something else. What would she do the next day? Take him to the dentist. <laughs> he said, I did not want, I could not get what I wanted out of her without getting something which I did not want out of her. <laughs> I wanted immediate relief from the pain, but I couldn't get it without having all my teeth set permanently right. And I knew the dentist they would start fiddling around with all the other teeth <laughs> that didn't even hurt yet. <laughs> and they would never let me alone until they worked on all my teeth. Is God like a good dentist? Jesus confronts the empty words and our empty hearts of those who claim to be in the kingdom, but we're not. And now we come to the end of the Sermon on the Mount. And we're going to read, it says... We wonder what the response is here. He's given one of the, the sermons, uh, all these red letters, Jesus speaking here now for three chapters. And what was the response of the people? So verse 28, it said, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were convicted, <laughs> converted, amazed, astonished. Because he had taught one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. In IV version says they were astonished. And they could have used a lot of words here in awe, amazed, dumbfounded, bewildered. If we look up the Greek word, it literally means they were struck out of themselves, struck out of their senses. Today we would say it blew their minds. They had never heard such wisdom or thought about God as a loving father as we heard in the Lord's prayer, that they could pray to him in such a personal way. They spoke with such truth and yet such love. They never heard anybody speak with power and authority. They were stunned and amazed. And so what is your response? Your eternal destiny depends on your response. Have you been placing your faith and trust in another any someone else other than God? What have you been putting your hope in? Confess those sins to God and place your faith and trust in him alone. Receive his love and rest in his faithful presence. It must be time to end. Allow all him to reveal his heart. Allow him to reveal his heart for you that you might know the wonders and the plans that he has for you. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. And Ephesians 3, 18 says, may you have the power to understand how wide and how long and how high and how deep is his love for you. 
in spite of our best intentions, we still sin. Sin, we admit and permit sin in our lives. Your regenerate spirit rises up and says, when you're having that bit of a moment, <laughs> get that out of here. It's incompatible with who I am now. That's what should happen. It's not that God doesn't love you when you sin, but that sin is an unwelcome guest. It makes you feel bad about yourself, robs you of your confidence towards God. So if you sin, repent. Stand up. Walk to the man. <laughs> Get on your knees. <laughs> Receive God's forgiveness and move forward stronger and wiser. In Matthew 5.25, Jesus laid down a very important principle, and we've heard, studied it in the past. He said, do what you know you must do now. Do it quickly. If you don't, an inevitable process will begin to work till you have paid the last penny in pain, agony, and distress. Because we know God's laws are unchangeable, and there's a no escape from them. The teachings of Jesus always penetrate right to our heart. Do it quickly. Bring yourself to judgment now. In moral and spiritual matters, you must act immediately. God is determined to have his child as pure and as clean and as white as driven snow. As long as there's any disobedience in, the, in the, any point of his teaching, he will allow his spirit to use whatever it takes to bring us to obedience. The fact that we insist on proving that we are right or have our own way is almost always a clear indication that at some point there's disobedience in our lives. Agree with your adversary quickly. Do you have anger in your heart towards someone? Confess it quickly and make it right. Be reconciled to that person and do it today. There is no heaven that has a little corner of hell in it. God is determined to make you pure, holy, and right. And he will not allow you to escape from the scrutiny of the Holy Spirit for one moment. He urges you to come to judgment immediately when he convicts you. But if you do not do obey, and you might even be asking, is that a God of mercy and love? But when we see it from God's perspective, it's a glorious, glorious ministry of love because God is bringing you to pure, spotless, undefiled, and he wants you to recognize the nature of the sinful, your sinful nature of demanding your own ways. The moment you surrender to God, he starts his good work in you. A new creation begins. The old is gone, amen? The moment you realize that God's purpose is to get you into the right relationship with himself. And then others will follow right relationship with others. He will reach the very limits of the universe to help you take the right road, the narrow path, the narrow gate. Decide to do it today. Obedience is the rock that shows our true faith Matthew 7, 24 says, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like the wise man who's built his house on the rock. Let's not forget that. The Beatitudes are the principles, the foundations of how to live a life of obedience to Christ. It's about God, our Father. The house represents the religious life. The rain represents divine judgment. Only the house built on the foundation of obedience to God's word will stand. On judgment day, only your relationship with Christ, accepting him as Lord and Savior of your life. Complete obedience to him will matter. Being a good person is not going to be good enough. Saying or doing religious things will not be enough. Only faith in Christ will be rewarded with eternal life. Judgment day is the final day of reckoning when God settles all accounts, judging sinning and rewarding our faith. To build on the solid rock means to be a hearing, responding disciple 
not a phony or superficial one. Practicing obedience becomes the solid foundation to the storms of our life. The two lives Jesus compares at the end of the mount have ser- several points. We've talked about it. They both build. They both hear Jesus teaching. They both experience the same set of circumstances. But the difference isn't caused by ignorance, but by one ignoring what Jesus said. Their lives look similar only from the outside. But you can't tell the structural difference until a storm comes. These sermons of Jesus are meant for your will and your conscience. Do now what you will do someday. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. God wants to empower you to make a difference in the world in the same manner as he's, he did his disciples. His plans for you doesn't involve that which is fleeting or false or shifting sands. At the end of your life, on Judgment Day, what will his words be to you? Good job. Well done, faithful servant. Or away from me. I never knew you. I never knew you naked and without shame. You never invited me to dwell with you. Isaiah 1, 18 says, Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. When you look back, will you be thankful that you obeyed, that you listened, that you said yes, that you chose to serve God wholeheartedly with every part of you? Eternity is not a bit of a moment. It's everlasting. It's what counts. Are you building on sinking sand? Do you feel the ground firm beneath your feet? Are you living in fear? Are you shaken as things seem to fall apart? Are you shut down and paralyzed and overwhelmed? Allow those answers to be indicators whether you are placing your faith and trust in God alone. The Lord is a firm foundation and the only solid place to build your trust. On Friday, I needed strength, and I was strengthening myself in the Lord. I was alone in this uh, church house before VBS started, and I worshiped, and I prayed, and then I laid it down across the front row of chairs right there. As I said earlier, Eric would woke me up at 3 o'clock in the morning to prepare to leave for a fire, and I needed a 10-minute nap. (laughs) I was the youngest of six kids of an Assembly of God pastor, and I have memories of falling asleep at the altar many, many times. And so there was my solid rock. There was my firm foundation. I felt a little bit like Elijah sleeping in that cave, (laughs) that firm foundation. You see, a bit of a moment can easily turn into sin of self-righteousness, self-pity, pride against God's will. We're not called to be perfect. We're called to be holy because God is holy. And that is not a threat. That is a promise. He's perfecting us. He's teaching us to be more like him. But it doesn't come without pain, and it doesn't come without cost and sacrifice. We must choose him as Lord and Savior. We must choose to pick up our cross and follow him today, pick it up, follow him tomorrow and the next day, putting our trust in him, building on the solid rock. Because all other is sinking sand. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word, your strong word today, God. I ask that uh, every word that is of Juanita would fall silent, Lord, but only your sure words, your firm foundation would stand, God, that you would echo your word and your scriptures into our hearts and minds today. Lord, that if everyone here has said yes to you, and if not, that they would not leave here today, without raising their hand and saying, today's the day, today's the day. 
And I don't want to end my prayer without assuming that each of us have already raised our hands. Is there anyone in this church house today that says, I have yet to totally, fully surrender my life to God? If it's so, could you just raise your hand in acknowledgement to me, to God? He sees your hand. Amen. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you that you speak and you chase after us and you pursue us and you forgive us with your mercy and your grace and your love. And even when we have a bit of a moment, we come running back to you, to your arms and wrap ourselves in your love and your grace and your mercy. Be with my friends today. I thank you in your mighty name. Amen. So we're going to end a little differently today, Elena. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we're going to say goodbye to our um, online friends. Uh, we did not have our prayer time during um, the service like we normally do, our prayer partners. Um, and we're going to have a time of prayer here at the altars. So we're going to say goodbye to our on online friends. If you have a prayer request, please uh, comment or message us. We would love to join with you in prayer. Uh, we're going to have a family time of prayer. If you have a prayer request, um, you'll be able to come up here with the, the prayer partners. And if you want to pray, if you need to go, please feel free to go. Enjoy the fourth. Come see us. Thank you for joining us today.